Genesis chapter 1 and verse 1. It says, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Genesis chapter 1 and verse 26 to verse 28. Then God said, let us make mankind, not one man. Let us make mankind in our image, in our likeness, so that they, not he, not him, so that they may rule over the fish of the sea and the birds in the sky, over the livestock and all the wild animals, and over all the creatures that move along the ground. So God created mankind in his own image. In the image of God, he created them. Male and female, he created them. God blessed them and said to them, Be fruitful and increase in number. Fill the earth and subdue it. Rule over the fish in the sea and the birds in the sky and over every living creature that moves along the ground. Verse 31 of Genesis chapter 1. God saw all that he had made and it was very good. Let me say that again. God saw all that he had made and it was very good. And there was evening and there was morning. The sixth day. Hallelujah. Let us pray. Father, in the name of Jesus, inscribe your will on our hearts this morning. Turn on the light in our minds. Help us to see from your perspective. Help us to understand your word like we've never understood it before. Shift us in thinking. Don't let this be another Sunday morning. Lord, let it be a revolution in somebody's life. Invade our thoughts with your revelation. Change us from within, O God. We thank you, Father, and we worship you. For in Jesus' name, we have prayed. For those who have been at Hill City for quite a while, you would probably remember a series I did a couple of years back that I titled, Life is a Journey. Um, I still believe that life is a journey. And in that series, I told you that life is a journey of discovery and becoming. I need you to pay attention. You've got to switch off your church and religious mind this morning and open yourself to the truth of God's word. Life is a journey of discovery and becoming. What you discover is what determines who you become. Who you become is the sum total of your experience. The greatest answer to your prayer is not the things that God gives you or the events and occurrences in your life. It is the person you become. And your becoming is tied to your discovery. And that was the series we did then. But I want you to take note this morning that even though life is a journey of discovery and becoming, essentially life is a journey backwards. Because the moment we say life is a journey, you need to understand before you move forward, you have to move backwards first. Life is a journey backwards. To get ahead in life, we have to go back to Eden. It's not enough. I know you met him at Golgotha and you received your salvation at Golgotha, but for you to move on from Golgotha, you have to go back to Eden. So what do I mean by Eden? You have to go back to the place of his original intention. The beauty of Genesis chapter 1 and chapter 2, some people call it the perfect portion of the Bible. Anything understand about God, anything you want to understand about God's intention towards you is in Genesis chapter 1 and chapter 2. See, when I look at Genesis chapter 1 and chapter 2, I see three things, okay, that I call God's original intention for humanity. God's original intention for humanity. And for each one of us to move forward, for each one of us to make progress, we have to master these three things that I'm talking about. Now, for the sake of understanding, I have labeled, okay, the three of them, they start with the letter C. For easy understanding. So you don't come to me and say, where is that in the Bible? How come? Mm-mm. I have, I have labeled, the reason why I'm preaching is so that you can understand. It's in the, if you had read the Bible yourself, you would have seen it. So the essence of all that we are doing is that you can do what? That you can understand. So there are three things that I see here. The first one is creativity. 
creativity. God's original intention for humanity, number one, creativity. Amen. Creativity. So he said in Genesis 1.26, let us make man in our image and after our likeness. Essentially, God was saying, let us make man to be essentially like us. Let us make man to be essentially like us. And when we look at Genesis chapter 1, the first expression of God in the Bible is his creativity. Amen. In the beginning, God created. So when he said, let us make man in our image, you need to realize you were created to create. If you are truly in the image of God, you are created to what? To create. In the Hebrew, it's Elohim bara. Bara means to make something out of nothing. You know, a lot of times when people are going through stuff and um, we say, let's pray about it. Some of you know, humorously I ask, what's the prayer point? It's because a lot of people don't think deep before they start praying. And most of the time, I make bold to tell you 60% of the time, we are asking God to do for us what he designed us to do for ourselves. In the beginning, Elohim bara. He made something out of nothing. This is what I'm trying to say. When you look at the book of Genesis, it's not just a history book. It's a pattern for living. God is saying you have a problem. You have to engage your mind in solving it. I don't have anything to work with. Exactly. You have to learn to create something out of nothing. When I look at Genesis chapter 1, I like to call God the God whose thoughts are things. The God whose thoughts are are things. And when he created you in his image, you need to realize that your own thoughts too are things. Some people just don't feed their thoughts. Some people don't develop their ability to think. Some people look at a problem and they forget that I am looking at is not all that there is to what is happening. Genesis chapter 1, God created the heavens and the earth. Verse 2 says, and the earth became without form and void. That was not the original plan. But the earth became, we have it in Genesis, we have it in Jeremiah. Jeremiah 17, I think. It says, go down to the potter's house. The Bible said, he saw the potter was making a piece of pottery. And the Bible said, and it became mad in his hands. The potter did not call a pity party. The Bible says, the potter packed the clay and molded it into another pot. That's a pattern for our living. Are you getting this? The God whose thoughts are things. God engaged Jeremiah. Jeremiah chapter 1 and verse 5. I love it. God says, before I formed you, I knew you. I take responsibility for you. I created you. But before you became a thing, you were my thought. Before I created, before I formed you, I knew you. And I ordained you a prophet to the nations. In other words, Jeremiah did not have to go and seek the face of God. You know, some people think people were called because of their spirituality. Some of us have no choice. We were called. Full stop. And you know something? You see, God gave us will. But like I like to explain to people all the time, the will of God is like putting a toddler in a playpen with 10 toys. As far as the toddler is concerned, I have options. I can do what I like. You see, but the mother is okay as long as you are in the playpen. Are you getting this? Some of us, we tried our best to go astray. We couldn't. Because we were coming here. So when things happen in your life that were not supposed to happen, you need to understand God will make it into another pot. But much more than that, when you are the one in charge, God says, I expect you to do the same. I created you in my image. Jeremiah 29, 11, God says, I know the thoughts that I think towards you. A translation says, I know the plan I have towards you. It makes no difference. God's thoughts are things. Amen? I know the thoughts I think towards you. I know the plan I have towards you. It says a plan of good and not of evil. Watch this. To give you an expected. And God is saying, it starts at my thoughts. But at the end of the day, it's going to be your experience. Did you catch that? I said, did you catch that? It begins as a plan. It begins as a thought. But at the end, it's going to be something tangible you can touch. Contextually was telling them about deliverance. And God is saying, when your physical status becomes free, You need to understand, free was what you were in my thoughts, even before you were captured. My thoughts become experiences. Now, I'm not talking so much about God tonight. I mean, this morning, I'm revealing you to you. 
I wish I have time in the course of this series to show you how that you can sit down with God and by thoughts you can create things. You know, even people who are not Christians understand this principle. Are you getting this? That device you hold in your hand that you are using to oppress your family members, that you are using to oppress everybody in your village, the people that sold it to you had five. After that, your own lined up before they released your own. Amen? See, that's why I, I don't joke with my thoughts anymore. I'm telling you, I don't joke with my thoughts anymore. In fact, some of the times, to tell you how absurd or how powerful this principle is, a lot of times I will think of something then I will go online and shop for it and I will see that somebody already thought of it and created it. So one day I said to myself, I wish I could have a system that would boot fast as my television. That I would put on my system. As at that time, we were just using HDD, the regular disk drives. But we didn't know there was SSD coming. Are you getting this? Now my current laptop, I can say good morning to you. I put on my laptop and before you say good morning, so my laptop is on. You may not understand what I'm saying if you didn't start where we started from. Where you put on your system and go and have your bath. <laughs> so I told you to put on the system. It's booting. It's booting. And it was a sheer waste of time. So very recently we got a light box. It, yeah, for video recording and, um, and it had a major defect. Okay. That was not getting us the best of experience. And I sat down and I said, what if there's a lap holder that looks like this? Look, and I described it in my mind. Then I went on AliExpress and I saw several merchants with different variants until the time I taught it, I did not know it existed before. Some of us are praying about things that somebody else conceived and has already produced. Stop praying to God for it. Start asking him for money to buy it because it's already in existence. Or oh, are you getting this? Thoughts are things. Thoughts are things. Hebrews chapter 11 and verse 3. By faith we understand that the universe was formed at God's command. Watch this. So that what is seen was not made out of what was visible. So when you look at your life right now, you've got to understand there is something you can experience that is not connected to anything that is physical. Because some of us make the mistake of con consulting our background, our current condition. Okay, right now I live in... Um, okay, let me use an area out of Lagos. I live in Beyerunka. You don't know where that is. Somewhere in Badon. So I live in Banana. How can I, how can I, how can I live in Banana Island? How can I become the person that lives in Banana Island? The Bible says what? The earth was formed at God's command so that the things visible now were made out of things that are saying, I don't have a certificate. I don't have connection. It does not matter. You can sit down with God and thoughts and shift. So but the challenge is people would rather pray than think. Because they think if you're a powerful, see, listen to me, listen to me. Sometimes when I preach like this, people think Pashego has something against prayer. Listen, I'm the lead pastor of this church. I was the one that God told when we started praying twice every day and we have done it for over four months. If I have anything against prayer, <laughs> we will not have obeyed that. I believe in prayer, I pray. See, I'm going to tell you, in fact, after this series, we're going to do another series in September. I have titled it, okay, The Prayer That Works. Because I want people to get it. Say, what are you doing? I'm, I'm praying about it. You were not designed just to pray about it. You were supposed to think your way to a solution. Because you are created in the image of God. Just like God, you can imagine something and declare it. See, but much more than declaring it, you will now go to work based on your thoughts. And you will produce it. That's how you get promoted at work. That's how you expand your business. That's how you improve your personality. And then you begin to attract wonderful relationships into your life. Did you come to church this morning? The second scene that I see in Genesis 1 and 2, is connectivity. You were created for connectivity. God created us to be connected to him and to one another. The source of a thing is the sustainers. You've heard me teach that before. Genesis 1, 26. Let us make man in our image and let them have dominion. Your success is tied to your tribe. Are you listening to me? This is what I'm saying. Beyond your effort, beyond your capacity, how far you will go is determined by the company you keep. Sila. Let us, let them. I'm going to read Psalm 8 after some time and you will see it in Psalm 8, but let's move on this morning. Let us, let them. So Genesis chapter 2 and verse 18, God said, it's not good for man to be alone. I will make a help suitable for him. That's what I call the triangle of success. Pay attention. It is not good. And when we say it's not good for man to be alone, please stop thinking only about marriage. 
The Bible, the Bible is so powerful. You need to understand the Bible is a code. Amen? You see, because if it was about marriage, God would just have brought Eve. Amen? God would just have brought Eve. And did you notice that everything God wants to do in your life, he wants you to exert yourself. The level of value you have for anything you receive is based on how you expended yourself before you got it. So God said, it's not good for man to be alone. But as far as his life is concerned, I'm involved. Amen? I will make a help. So listen, every good relationship in your life will come from God. So the beauty of your relationships is tied to your connection to God, not your ability to broker relationships. God says, I'm the one that will make a help suitable for him. And for him to get to the end of himself, the Bible said, and God brought all the animals to Adam to see what he would name them. Who said he would make a help? God. But God wanted him to expand himself for man to understand. What you are looking for is not a function of your effort. Bible said he named all the animals and there was no help found for Adam. So God put him into a deep sleep. Listen to me, this is what I'm saying. With all your intelligence, with your paycheck right now, with all your qualifications, you have to leave that space for God. Without providence, you are an experiment. Are you listening to me this morning? You are just an experiment. Amen? I mean, there was one guy, I was just reading online yesterday and they said he died. This time last year, I was a very powerful man. And he died. Just like that. Amen? And there are people that have been here for 80 something years, 90 something years, 100 and something years. They don't know as much as he knows. They have not done as much as he has done. They don't have his connections, but they are still here. He died. Hallelujah. Let me tell you the blessing of COVID-19. After all this noise dies down, when the test becomes cheap, some of you, you will go and test and they will tell you you have it. And like pregnancy, they probably will be able to tell you for as long as it has been in your body. But then it never affected you. Oh boy. (laughs) I'm not telling you to be careless. But I'm telling you when God has a reason for you, he will keep you here. Amen? If you go and read that Matthew 24, Jesus said, look, some of you, they will be killed. Then he said, the rest of you, not even the hair on your body will be touched. So it's not just about, I'm righteous, it's about purpose. So those ones that were killed, were they sinful people? No! Oh, I wish people would listen to me, that there are people, there are a few of us, that sometimes God will appoint you for a journey unlike every other person. So he left the book of Job in the Bible for you. Hello? That you just don't come to God, come to his presence, and just begin to cry because you look at some other people's lives. That you say, God, let's talk. What's your plan for me? What's your will for me? Why did you have me come this way? John chapter 15 and verse 4 to 5. Remain in me and also, and I also remain in you. No branch can bear fruit by itself. It must remain in the vine. Neither can you bear fruit unless you remain in me. I am the vine, you are the branches. If you remain in me and I in you, you will bear much fruit. Apart from me, you can do nothing. So when I say you were created for connectivity, the first one is connectivity with God. Then you've got to also be what? Be connected with people. It's not good for a man to be alone. I will make a help suitable for him. Psalm 68 and verse 6. I'm going to read just the first line from the Bible in basic English. It says, those who are without friends, God puts in families. Amen? So next time when you wake up, I'm all by myself. I can run it by myself. I know what I am doing. God says, if you are going to be in the center of my will, first I will place you not with friends, in a family. Hallelujah. Okay? With a family. So would you say to your neighbor now, you can do that now. And for those who are still watching online, you can type it in the comment section. Tell the person sitting beside you, locate your team. Find your tribe. Come on, say one more time. Say, locate your team. Find your tribe. Say one more time, locate your team. Then say, find your tribe. And the final C this morning is control. You were created for control. Now somebody is saying, woo, Pastor Shego, control... I told you before now that I used C, just so that you understand. So for the purpose of this discussion, you need to understand that when I say control, I mean jurisdiction, I mean influence, I mean authority, I mean power, I mean dominance. But I'm trying to show you some other things. You see, but you've got to realize you were created for control. Let us make man in our image and let them what? Have dominion. You were created for 
control. Now, let me help you understand for, for people who have issues with the word control. I said control. I didn't say manipulation. Control. Okay, Google defines control as the power to influence or direct people's behavior or the course of events. Amen? So nobody's controlling me. Nobody's controlling me. But you have a boss in the office. And when you wake up tomorrow morning, regardless of the way you feel, you go to work. Nobody's controlling you. So when I say control, you know what I mean. They don't have to pick up the phone and say, Naomi, sir, come here now. But by reason of the structure they are put in place, you have no choice but to show. So, Pishak, you don't understand. I'm an entrepreneur. I control my time. I do what I like. It's a lie. Every entrepreneur has multiple bosses to the degree to which you want to succeed. <laughs> I'm telling you, they said the customer is king. So, how many bosses do you have? All your customers. The, ent- the employee has one boss, or perhaps a number of bosses. The entrepreneur, many bosses. And if you don't understand the concept of control, you will be stranded in life. Are you getting this? You will what? You will be stranded in life. Everybody was created by God. It's an innate design us for jurisdiction. Everybody. Are you getting this? Everybody. That's why as you begin to mature and you leave, you notice your parents will start saying things like, so when are you buying your land? When are you building your house? How much do you have saved? How much do you have investment? These are tools of control. Amen? Tools of control. And the more tools you have, the greater control you have. Amen? And you have to use thoughts and connectivity to secure control. Are you getting this? You have to use your creativity and your connectivity to establish what? Your control. Your dominance. You've got to pick a field in which you are going to rise and dominate. Are you getting this? And dominate. I don't know if you understand what I'm saying. So Pep Guardiola said that if you have the ball, you have a higher chance of scoring goals. So every team he has coached, and even after he has left, have you noticed they maintain that pattern of dominance? We must keep the ball. No matter what happens, we must keep the ball. We must keep the ball. Where is the ball in your life? Some people don't even know where the ball is. (laughs) Some people don't know where the ball is. Not to talk of keep the ball. And when you watch them, you will notice there is a way they pass. They've mastered some, I don't have my statistics here, but some matches, they will tell you how many passes they made just to keep the ball. Some of us don't know where the ball is in our lives, not to talk of where you passing it to. That when the devil attacks your money, you've got to learn to kick the ball from there to somewhere else. And let control come from somewhere else. And structure your life as such that you know in your life what my defense is. You know in your life what my meal feed is. You know in your life what your striker is. What are the things I do that bring my resources? What are the things I do to defend myself? I wish I had time. See, I, I don't know if you picked it in my interview with Dr. Banji. See, you've got to have mental toughness. It's a defense mechanism. It's a tool of control. Psalm 8 and verse 3 to 9. And I'm going to show you two things from here now. When I consider your heavens, the work of your hands, the moon, the stars, which you have set in place, what is mankind that you are mindful of them? Human beings that you care for them. God is mindful of you. You know why? God's major investment is in us. So God is mindful. God is the chairman of your company. He's mindful of you. And the psalmist is saying, why? Why are you mindful of man? Now look at verse 5. You have made them, not him. You have made them a little lower than angels. But the Hebrew word there is Elohim. And the reason why they translated it in some translations of the Bible as angels is because, you see, it's not a religious word. And so it's the same word in plural form that they used to describe gods in plural form. It's the same word that they used to, I mean, that would used to describe uh, um, supernatural beings. But if you know Genesis chapter 1, and then you connect it to Psalm 8, you understand that the Elohim here is God himself. Because he said, let us make man in our image and after our likeness, so we cannot be a little lower than Obatala, nor angels. Is a little lower than God himself. Elohim himself. Just like a father and a son. My son has everything I have, but my son is a mini-me. 
Amen? So he said, I've told you that what? Ye are gods and sons of the Most High. Are we getting this? And the mark of sonship is discretion. Oh, let me, let me run to the next series and bless you. One of the things that makes prayer powerful is discretion. It's not just going to God and bombarding God. Father, your word says, Father, your word says, I said, but Lord, I figured it, I've taught it, you know. I, I, would you do it this way? I don't have a point of reference, but use my imagination to understand. If I can think it, you can do it. God, let's do it this way. Before Isaac was raised from the dead, because Hebrew says figuratively, he was raised from the dead. Nobody was raised from the dead, but the Bible said Abraham reasoned. That if God can give life to a dead womb, then God can bring the dead back to life. No point of reference. You are busy shouting. The Bible says, the Bible says, the Bible says. Which Bible did Abraham read to become the father of faith? Amen. Amen. He's still the father of faith, Abi. And which Bible did he read? Who was his pastor? I know you will say Melchizedek. It was a chance meeting. Melchizedek did not have a church that Abraham was going to every week. There was even no record that they met again. Faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God, not by the teachings of the pastor, by Rema, by you hearing from God yourself. It's about connectivity. It's about fellowship. It's about what he says to you and how you process it with your imagination. Genesis 1, I mean 22 says, God told Abraham, go and sacrifice your son in one of the mountains of Moriah. That was God's word to Abraham. Then after that, he processed it. Can you get this? I came to deliver you from religion. See, that you will go into God's presence, that you will worship, that you will fellowship with him to the point where you hear him for yourself. So that if your pastor backslides, your faith is not in jeopardy. You have made them a little lower than Elohim, than God himself. He says, and crown them with glory and honor. You made them rulers over the works of your hands. Oh, so, so, so when you see an animal, use your thoughts, experiment with it. Don't shout and say it's a demon. Did you get that? It's because the moment you see, I have authority over this one. Everything apart from humans, you have control over. But your control is limited by your connectivity. Because it is them he gave dominion, not him. So your dominion is limited. To your what? Ability to what? To connect with the right people. You have made them rulers over the works of your hands. You put everything. Somebody say everything. Come on, say everything. You put everything under their feet. All flocks and herds, all the animals of the wild, the birds in the sky, the fish in the sea, all that swim in the parts of the sea. Then it says in verse 9, Lord, our Lord, how majestic is your name in all the earth. Can you see the triangle of success here? For God's name to be majestic on the earth, man has to connect with fellow man, connect with God, and be God on earth. These are just three deductions and I'm just going to read them out to you. So the first thing I observe from the three C's is that the three C's are critical to success. That as we move on from here, you just don't put a band-aid of religion on your life, but that you sit down and critically look at your life in the light of the three C's. Creativity, connectivity, and control. The next thing I observed is that every problem can be traced to a deficiency in one or more of the three C's. Every problem. So pastor, you don't understand. I have this problem in my life. It's money. I don't have money. No, you don't know enough people. So you can't raise that amount of money. Or you don't know people that have that kind of money. Because some people don't know what's happening. Some people don't know where the opportunities are. You don't know people that know. And pastor, how do I know people that know? If you are creative enough, you'll be attractive. Listen, people run after people with solution. I'm telling you the truth. People run after people with solution. Let me round up with this. When you suffer, in, when you lack one, you will struggle with the rest. When you lack one, you will struggle with the rest. And they are connected in that order of importance. Creativity first. Followed by connectivity. Followed by control. We pray to God for control. He said, no, it's not a prayer issue. You have to go from creativity to connectivity. And then to control. See, what I want you to do when you get home is to sit down with three C's. 
I know that wherever I'm going in the future is a function of what? Stresses. Have you been blessed this morning? I said, have you been blessed this morning? Will you come next week Sunday? Was it worth it? Okay, let's give God praise this morning. Come on, let's rise up on our feet. Let's rise up on our feet this morning.